So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third webinar in the series of Data Hack for FI webinars brought to you by Insight to Impact. My name is Robert Jones, and I am the in-country lead for Data Hack for FI in Zambia and Southern Africa. Today's webinar topic is using data to scale your product and grow your business. And we have three wonderful presenters lined up for you uh, for this webinar. The first will be Megan, who is the founder of XEO Analytics. The second will be a team effort from Yvette and Timothy from Superfluid Labs. And then the final contribution will be from Roslyn, who is the product partnerships lead at Yoko. Uh, after the three have presented, we will then uh, uh, we'll close the webinar with a brief Q&A session with our presenters. So if you have any questions for our presenters, please use the Q&A function within Zoom. So if you look at the bottom of your, your uh, ribbon, there is a Q&A tab there. So if you would like to pose questions to the panelist, please use that functionality and we'll try to address as many of these as possible within our limited time available. Uh, and before you disappear at the very end of the webinar, there is a brief post event survey that we'd like you to complete as well. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Megan. Great, thanks very much, Rob, and thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, so a little bit um, to kick off. Um, so I'm Megan, and I founded Xio, which is a data science consulting business. Um, do a lot of advisory and consulting work, work with corporates across the continent. Um, and also recently was a co-founder of Zindi, which is a data science competition platform. Um, in terms of emerging companies, um, I get quite excited because I think that they're really in a place where um, they can have like quite a big impact. Um, do you mind going to the next slide? <laughs> Great, thanks Rob. Um, so yeah, when we work with corporates, I think, sorry, previous one. Great, thanks Rob. Uh, so when we work with corporates, I think what, the reason I get excited working with um, younger organizations is they're really in a place where they can take advantage of new technologies. Um, they're almost starting with like a blank slate, whereas older companies, especially, um, you know, like the larger banks and insurance companies, they really struggle with um, legacy systems and they're spending a huge amount of money on just fixing and, yeah, and, and building and um, they end up, you know, being a little bit slower to move in terms of like taking advantage of new technologies, whereas I think emerging companies are really in a position to um, do extremely, extremely well. Um, so yeah, we, we really enjoy working in this space and, and helping those emerging companies to take, take advantage of new technologies and just do things right and do it quickly. Um, and yeah, hopefully <laughs> um, show up some of those big old corporates that have been around for a really long time. <laughs> cool, um, you can move on to the next one. Um, so in terms of um, helping companies, um, so we, we really are focused on helping companies along this analytics maturity curve, which I'm sure some of you guys have seen before. Um, so stage one is really like an organization that is really not using data. Um, and we would say analytically impaired, essentially. Um, and then right through to stage five, which is really a competitive company that is using analytics to drive a lot of decision making um, and, you know, using things like recommendations for customers and things like that. And where a lot of the analytics is prescriptive. Um, and yes, yeah, so we're involved in helping uh, companies along that journey. Um, and a couple of ways we help companies get there is we firstly look at people. So we find that a lot of um, companies look at like bringing in new staff, but actually um, also looking internally is a really great idea. So internal staff really have a good view of the problems and challenges that the business has. Um, so it's often really good to kind of look at, you know, what kind of people are already in the company and who can you kind of pull into a data team. Um, and that's worked really well in the past for us, just in terms of like um, that kind of continuity and understanding the business. Um, but then obviously also bringing in the right people to help you uh, make use of, of data within your organization. And that's important. Um, the second thing is really try and get started quickly. Um, there's sometimes like a view um, in, in companies like we have to get data into this certain perfect structured format to get any value from it. 
we find that it's better to just start with what you have and try and use what you have while obviously trying to to get to a better place in terms of your data structures but um waiting until it's perfect is really wasting time and and i mean being a little bit of a perfectionist myself um you, yeah that data data set won't ever be perfect and so you really need to like think differently about how you how you get started with data just to kind of dive in and say you know what kinds of decisions can i make today from data rather than um, waiting for that perfect data set, which isn't going to happen. Uh, the third one is really trying to understand the business. So spending time with different stakeholders across different divisions and trying to really understand where their challenges are um, and then designing kinds of use cases that you can try and solve with data. And I think that really that partnering with stakeholders um, you know i can't stress that enough it's really important to have their buy-in but also to to build solutions that really try and solve their problems and you know make their lives easier um, and help them get results with data um, too often analysts and data scientists are often like you know focused on data and reporting that doesn't always um, that might be a little bit too theoretical and doesn't always help the business um, yeah, so I'd like to stress that one a lot. And then the fourth one is really taking advantage of open source tools. So we have amazing, amazing tools um, available now that are really cost effective. Um, so we, you know, we really love to code in R and Python and, and build things like that. So we, you know, we help companies get away from like these huge licensing costs, um, which often, you know, hold them back from tackling data, data projects. Um, so that also goes back to that first one of investing in people, investing in the right people that have those skills um, and also upskilling. So we, you know, we've often taken people within an organization and upskilled them in terms of Python and, and data science and machine learning. Um, and then the last one is obviously automating. So really trying to move away from manual processes. I think it's, you know, it's really easy to do build a report and do things manually, but sometimes it's really hard to implement data solutions and fully automate, but it's really worth it for the organization, um, obviously in terms of cost, um, but then also just um, getting to a place where, you know, things are easier and things are flowing. Um, yeah, cool. Can Great, thanks. So just a quick case study um, where we've kind of taken those principles and implemented them. Um, so this was a bank in, um, in West Africa. It was quite a young bank. And when we first started chatting to them, you know, they didn't have a central database. You know, they had, you know, data, really ma manual processes in their data. And, um, and they didn't have a central kind of data team. So they had a couple of people doing some reports here and there in the organization. And what we did is we identified those people and brought them together into one team. Um, we saw a lot of value for them like sitting together, but then still maintaining those, those partnerships with stakeholders and different divisions across the bank. Um, and we spent a lot of time upskilling, but also, you know, getting things right. So looking at like different metrics and how they were measuring things and, and really kind of, you yeah, focusing on that, um, while also identifying key use cases for the bank. So really saying like, what kinds of things can we use the data for that will really make a big impact in, in the bank. And we had really great success with that. Um, and then, yeah, we, you know, we used that principle of like use open source tech to do great things. And we used a lot of R and Python to build some really cool dashboards for them. Um, and yeah, so the, the bank is now in a place where they've got a really good data team that understands the business challenges because they came from, you know, from those divisions. But they, you know, they're also in a place where they're taking advantage of new technologies and new skills um, to drive value for the business. Next slide, please. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, just thinking about like what a small business can do now. Um, what I would say is really, you know, spend time trying to think about the future and what you want to do with your customers. I think customers are really central to any business today. And I think it's really great to spend time like, you know, thinking of a wish list of like in, in five years time, what do I want to be doing with my customers and how can I do things better? Um, the second one is really, you know, develop a data strategy and start now. So say like, you know, what can I start collecting today if I'm not yet collecting any data? Um, and what do I want to be collecting, you know, maybe in a year's time and, and plan for that. I think the longer you like put that change off, the, you know, the worse of a position you'll be in. So it's really worth it to spend time and, and just start. Um, don't, don't keep putting it off. 
Um, and then the last one is, so just, you know, in terms of like the, the culture, so even if you don't have a lot of data, you have some data, um, even if it's just financial data, you know, look at that financial data in a different light and say, you know, if I look at my finance data, for example, what kind of, you know, insights can I get and what kinds of decisions would I make differently in my business um, and just start that culture change of really thinking in a data driven way. Cool. And yeah, that's it from me. And I think we've got a Q&A session towards the end. Thank you very, very much, Megan. That was very insightful. Um, as I did mention, let's try and save uh, all the, the Q&A for the end so we can maximize our time available to our speakers. So without further ado, we will move on to our next two speakers who are uh, Yvette and Timothy from Superfluid Labs. Thanks, Robert. Can you hear me okay? Can hear you perfectly. Fantastic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, thank you. So, Superfluid Labs is a data analytics uh, business whose mission is to expand opportunity for people and businesses through the power of data and AI. Um, what does this mean? What this means is that we work with other businesses from small startups, emerging businesses across different sectors to large established legacy industries, so banks, insurance companies. And what we do is we help these organizations uh, to really harness the power of data to better deliver services to their customers. And uh, our work has been recognized by uh, many leading organizations. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this slide shows an example of some of the clients that we've worked with. So I2I is an example of an organization we work with. We've also worked with a number of uh, banks in East Africa and West Africa. Uh, we have presence in Kenya, in Ghana, as well as in Germany. Um, and a number of the organizations here, Kudobaz is a startup uh, in the retail consumer analytics space uh, out of Ghana. They've now expanded to other African countries. Uh, Umati Capital is also um, a startup in uh, financial inclusion space based out of Kenya. Uh, Isoko and PharmaLine are also, again, technology startups that are working to provide, to leverage the power of data to deliver better agricultural services and input financing to smallholder farmers in East Africa as well as West Africa. Next slide, please. So at this point, my colleague Yvette to take over and speak to some of the benefits of data science to emerging companies. Yvette, are you there? I should be Hello? Hi, Yvette, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Timothy. Hello, everyone. So um, data science, well, before talking about how data can scale a business, we'll talk about some of the benefits of um, data. So data can um, be used to expand your customer base. To be, um, you can also use it to innovate um, on your products and services, also use it to optimize your business operations and also manage risk in your business. Here's the next slide. So how do you do this? Um, you need to opt, um, optimize, um, leverage on alternative and traditional data sources. And some of the traditional data sources could be your customer and transactions data, and uh, the alternative data sources could be social media data like LinkedIn and mobile money. And what happens is you are able to profile your customers. When this data is mined, you're able to profile your customers, understand their behavior, um, and also meet them at their point of need, providing for them what is relevant for them because you're able to come up with a data product or a recommendation engine that is able to provide um, your customer suggestions that um, provide your customer with suggestions that 
will make them um, that they are more likely to respond to and to patronize your brand or product more. And they are also able to manage the risk involved in providing services. For example, if you are a credit um, provider, you want to be able to leverage on data to understand the payment behaviors of your customers so that you're able to lend the right amount of money and the right um, um, quantity, right amount of money to the right customers in order to sh um, manage the risk of them defaulting. Okay, next slide, please. Hello? Yeah. Next slide, please. Hello? Yeah, next slide, please. Can we have the next slide? Thank you. Um, so, so we've talked about the theoretical benefits that you can get from data science, but we thought to share a few case studies just to make this a bit more practical. So uh, NPLs, stands for non-performing loans. And non-performing loans are a big problem to a lot of banks. Uh, what are non-performing loans? So usually when banks lend to individuals or small businesses, the assumption is that the individuals will pay back. But there's a risk that some of those individuals will not pay back. And that is very often one of the reasons why banks charge an interest to cover for the individuals that don't pay back. But in many African uh, countries and many emerging markets, uh, many banks are saddled with this problem of high non-performing loans. They've lent to a lot of businesses and individuals, and individuals have not paid back, which is a big problem for these banks. It affects their profitability. Um, next, please. Yet at the same time that some banks are struggling with very, very high non-performing loans, there are a few others, other businesses like Safaricom in Kenya, that are achieving fantastic success in this same space. So uh, earlier this year, Safaricom, in partnership with two banks in Kenya, uh, Commercial Bank of Africa and uh, KCB, launched a lending product, a mobile money overdraft product called Fuliza. And the product was so successful that in just the first eight days, we were able to meet one million customers and also lend $10 million, so 1 billion shillings around $10 million. And at this point, you may be wondering, uh, how are they able to do this? So next slide, please. So the, the bank and Safaricom were able to do this by leveraging big data analytics. And what does that actually mean practically? Well, in this case, what it means is that they were able to analyze the calling behavior habits of customers, how often people topped up their airtime, whether they bought airtime in small amounts or larger amounts, whether they made long distance calls, whether they used mobile money to predict which individuals were going to be good borrowers for a loan facility from uh, the bank, or which people were going to be bad borrowers so that they would not be uh, they'll be given lower loan amounts. And this is a very clear example of how data analytics allowed an organization to not only develop a new product, but also manage risk that was associated with this product and also deliver a service that meets uh, the need of customers by understanding the individual credit worthiness of individual customers. Next slide, please. Great. And this is a second example. So this is uh, an, a web portal called Carduca. Uh, what is Carduca? Carduca is a vehicle marketplace for individuals who want to sell their vehicles or buy their vehicles. And on this portal, if I have the car and I wanted to sell the car, I could uh, come to this website, enter the details about my vehicle, the country of origin, the make of the car, is it a Toyota, uh, the model, the year of manufacture, uh, the price or the mileage. And this portal would give me uh, the value of this car in the market. 
And you can imagine that this information is extremely useful for individuals that want to buy vehicles or sell vehicles. Um, why do I tell you this story? I tell you this story because uh, Superfly Labs supported one of the leading asset finance banks in Kenya called NIC Bank to build this platform. And what made this platform possible was the use of machine learning to predict the value of vehicles um, to allow the bank to be able to assess whether how much a particular asset or vehicle that an individual wanted to purchase was worth and also to allow individuals to estimate how much uh, it will cause them to buy or sell a vehicle. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so this is a platform that Superfleet partnered with the NIC Bank to develop. And we've also worked with, these are just uh, two examples. We've also worked with uh, several other startups and small businesses as well to develop innovative uh, products using data, data science and machine learning. I would hand over now to Yvette to conclude. So here are some considerations when you are um, trying to incorporate the data science process into your work stream as an emerging company. You need to understand your value proposition and business philosophy so that you are able to um, collect the relevant data that you would require to um, make business um, decisions that would drive your growth. You need to collect high quality data to enable an effective data science process as well because the quality of your data directly impacts the data science results. And then you need to leverage alternative sources of data to enrich insights generated from your traditional data sources. You need to establish a data-driven culture from the onset. So everyone working in your team must have the mindset of the importance of data so everyone sticks to um, um, observing the good um, practices. You need to also identify data champions across all your service and functional areas in order to um, ensure that a data champion is someone who is uh, in charge of uh, managing the data and ensuring that rules regarding the proper storage and collection of data is, um, is observed. And also you need to invest in tools that automate common or repetitive tasks. And next slide, please. For uh, um, and such an example of a tool for automating data science and machine learning is SuperML, which is a tool developed by Superfluid Labs, and it can be located on the by the screen, the the link on the screen. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Yvette and Timothy. And now we will move on to our last speaker who is Rosalind from Yoko. Thanks very much and hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Rosalind, I uh, am leading the payment um, projects team and payment uh, product strategy team within Yoko. I've been at Yoko for about a year. Prior to that, I was at Payfast and was running my own thing for a while before that and worked for another startup before that. So I've worked for quite a few different versions, very different styles of startups. Um, so I'm taking uh, this talk on scale from a slightly different perspective to, to kind of bring in a different, a different view of what needs to be, be considered. Um, so the, the key thing that really I have experienced and noticed is that as we are looking at, at companies at scale, um, one, of the, one of the key things is that what ends up happening is, is that there's a bit of a shift between the, 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 a small business being able to handle information and, and projects and things in quite an ad hoc, very agile, very fluid motion uh, kind of style. And, and, and there's a point at which you need to start formalizing. And I think the, the previous two, two presentations have spoken to this a little bit already, so it, it segues quite well into, into this, this concept of there's, there's a point at which you need to start figuring out what that formalization looks like, and particularly from a data perspective. At, at Yoko, for instance, it's a very data-driven 
company and has been from the start. It was something that was a, a very conscious decision from, from the founders. And, and that has stimulated a lot of um, thinking in terms of how and where things can be improved. The side that I want to look at today particularly is to consider what the difference is between how we scale a business from a product perspective versus what we're doing from an internal perspective. So I'm going to focus the rest of this talk primarily on what happens at the point at which you stop being able to be super agile and how does that affect teams internally in, in the company. So next slide. Um, so this is is just to kind of understand why this is important and why this is something that has come up a lot, and particularly in my experience of working for, for different startups, this has been the, the area that actually ends up causing a lot more tension between, between people and causes a, a lot of slowdown in work from a product perspective because you spend so much time worrying about how you are interacting as a team. So this is a good representation to kind of understand why this suddenly gets really complex. And the it's, it's a theory around, um, there are a few references on there which can be shared afterwards. So it's, the, it's a theory of, of just how many connection lines you have to have between people as team scale and as group scale. And you can see that the, the picture starts to look incredibly complicated, even at the number of, of 14 people, which doesn't seem that big. So there's quite a lot of research around what the size of teams are that are optimal, that function optimally. Um, it does depend a lot on, on what you're doing, and there's quite a lot of different theories depending on the kinds of teams that you're looking at. But I think it's important to, to keep in mind as you're growing that this, these are the kinds of things that start to break down as you scale, and often they're the kinds of things that you tend to, to not necessarily consider or realize in the beginning uh, because you're so focused on your product. Next slide. So I'm just very briefly going to go through a few kind of key things. These are um, information pieces or points to consider as you are scaling uh, that came from a few people within within Yoko and just my own experience in working for different in for different teams. So the key really is prepare early, and that has come up previously in with the previous uh, present presentations as well. And something there to to be able to allow you to really keep that in mind is asking yourself, well, what I am doing now work with ten x customers. Uh, with 10x employees, with 10x markets. And, and this is where really I think these are the kinds of things where data starts to become um, critically important as well, is, is what I, is understanding and having a visual sight on what is happening and what does 10x look like? What do you, what do you, um, what is a scale? What does this company look like at scale? And I think you can start to get some of that from a data perspective as well. But it's important to keep in mind is that we also need to be considering that as you're scaling, employees are part of that and they also need to be considered. And there's a lot of preparation that needs to be done early on to get everyone on the same page to be, to be keeping that in mind. Uh, something that is potentially quite interesting here, there's a I haven't included it too much in this talk from a time perspective, but there's a concept that a lot of startups use, which was popularized by uh, Google, which is called OKR, so it's ob um, Objectives and Key Results, which is a methodology around how you align uh, key objectives within the company as your teams are scaling and as you no longer have the ability to just rely on personal connections and personal information that is exchanged between different people individually. Next slide. So the next key point on this was to, to keep focus. So this is something that I have noticed particularly in working with companies. And, and I think part of what is interesting about this is that there seems to be a defining point at around 20 employees is, is the point at which the conversation starts of uh, you'll notice immediately people starting to consider, well, how are we communicating and communication lines are falling and this is where 
there's also coupled with that there's a extra element of I now suddenly have too many projects and I don't have capacity to be able to handle all of these projects and very often prior to that point as a company you've been able to say yes to every opportunity that has come your way so although you may have a key focus in terms of what your strategy is as a business there has been the ability from a resources perspective to for the most part take up opportunities and explore different opportunities as soon as you start getting past that um, initial phase of figuring out and once you started to get product market fit you now start to end up with a lot of questions as to which things am i prioritizing what are my projects which ones am i saying no to i think is the key there very easy to understand what you're trying to say yes to and okay i specifically can speak to that but it, it's important to kind of understand what am i also saying no to because sometimes that is more important than what you're saying yes to uh, because it's, it's impossible to be saying yes to anything until you're saying no to other things next slide Staying responsive is the, the next key thing. And again, this is where data is incredibly important and useful. Being able to understand how your business is shaping and moving as you go in real time is where data really becomes important. And I think the real time aspect of that is key. So if you are going to be moving faster than competitors, if you're going to be pushing boundaries and innovating, you need to be able to be responsive in a real time basis and be changing your decisions that you're making based on new information that you receive so there's a there's an element of flexibility and uh, fail fast and all of those concepts that come up quite a lot in in the concepts of, of startup companies but in order to do that you need to have that information and be able to to navigate the environment and that's understanding your own company internally as well as understanding what's going on in the market which is a little bit more difficult but if you can at least understand where you sit from an internal perspective you've got a lot to go on initially <coughs> next slide so this is just um i think this has also been been brought up a few times so using tools is a key way to understand both your data as well as manage your company internally as your as your teams are growing there's a whole bunch of tools out there. It sometimes can be a bit of a minefield. These are some of the tools that, um, uh, that I have either used before or are used at Yoko. Uh, one or two of them I actually haven't used before, but I've, the number of people have recommended them before. It does depend very much on the scale of your company. I know something that, that Yoko particularly does as well is tools get changed quite a lot. So they get adopted quite quickly and changed out quite quickly, which is just responding to the difference in size. As you scale them, you need different kinds of tools, you need different services. So we add tools and we replace tools quite often. There is a little bit of a, a, a legacy problem there as well sometimes that it is uh, you spending a lot of time redoing certain work a fair amount. But I do think that the, the, the benefit at the end of the day ends up being a lot, a lot greater. So they are, these are just a bunch of, of different things. Um, product Hunt is, should kind of be the central one. That's where you can go and find a bunch of different tools. They have this interesting concept called the Founders Club, which is a, uh, a club that you can kind of join. And I think there's a fee associated to it on a yearly basis, but it gives you access to a huge range of different tools, particularly as you start in your company. So that might be an interesting thing to, to consider. But beyond that, it, it really depends on what your, what your company needs and where your business is and what kind of tools are useful. But these are some interesting ones that, that potentially um, are not necessarily well known. Uh, some may obviously be well known, but yeah. So that's, that's me. I hope that helps. Perfect. Thank you very, very much, Rosalind, for that. Um, so we will now move on to the, the Q&A portion of our webinar. And I see that there aren't any questions being posed in the Q&A. So if you do have any questions for our panelists, please post those in the Q&A section now. But uh, from my side, I've jotted down a few. So my, my first question, uh, question goes to Rosalind. And it's around the data hack typically uh, looks at startups and emerging companies that are still trying to to grow their business. And typically in these sorts of businesses, they have limited staff capacities and limited staff numbers. So what advice would you have for, for small businesses and, and emerging businesses around when you know your growth is sustainable 
and it's able to sustain new staff complement. So I think in terms of new staff complement, that's, that's, a, that's a very tricky one, which is going to be depending on kind of what your funding is. I, I think a lot of the time that becomes a financial decision and a financial um, difficulty there. I know there's a huge amount of research in terms of understanding when you have product market fit. I think the things that I have heard from people, which this is unfortunately not too specific because it's, it's tricky, tricky when you don't necessarily understand the company, but um, the things that, that, or the kind of general concept that has come out a few times is, is be as lean as possible in the beginning. A lot of these things are, it's easy to get caught up into the perfect way of doing things. And I think until you understand what your product is, until you have a bit of stability in terms of knowing that you've got paying customers, that the business model works, that there's some kind of, uh, initial base layer to work from really your key focus is being as agile as possible so a lot of the things that I'm talking now about getting into formalization mode is important to think of once you start reaching that and I think for me key really is under identifying when that stage comes and there are a few kind of key points that move you over into that um, that I think end up becoming they're, they're kind of like practical things. So things like hitting 20 people is your first stage, hitting 50 people is your next stage when you need to start thinking about different levels of formalization. Um, so people is one way to, to look at that. And I would probably say the size of clients that you're dealing with or the number of clients that you're dealing with might be another way in order to identify when you have gone over that, that threshold. And, and particularly just listening to the people that you are working with. When, when conversations start coming out around communication being a problem, focus and identifying what you should be doing or not doing and that kind of thing, I think that's a key sign to start in like, realizing maybe I need to take a step back and look at this differently but initially I would I would say ideally actually you want to be doing the complete opposite and and not worrying about those things and and being as agile as possible and um yeah I, I would say it's probably the complete reverse of all of those things being uh, you know being able to, to um, navigate your market more easily and quickly perfect thank you very much that was very comprehensive um, so the next question is for Megan, and this comes via our Q&A. It comes from Jeff. So the question is, does open source eventually get costly for businesses to own versus out-of-the-box integrated solutions? Thinking in terms of code maintenance, customization, enhancements, et cetera, could cloud solutions that are subscription-based, so paying per usage, help reduce costs of ownership? Cool. Thanks, Rob. Um, and thanks, Jeff, for the question. Um, I think it really depends on the internal skills that you have. I think if you've got very competent um, tech people and obviously good like sustainability um, and like plans, you know, when stock change, I think no. Um, but I think if you struggle in terms of like the tech staff that you have in a company, especially if you're small, um, then yeah, it might make sense. I think that yeah, from what we've seen working with organizations, um, it's always been better to go open source, um, generally like for machine learning models and things like that, um, rather than having the license costs associated with them. But yeah, I think it's really, really up to people um, and what tech skills you have on your team. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Megan, I do have a follow-up question for you because you mentioned the availability of, of key skills. So um, in your work as a, as a consultant, could you expand on some of the challenges that you faced um, in, your, in your journey in, in working with companies and helping them to become data-centric and trying to instill an institutional culture that appreciates data science and understands the value to be gained? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I think the, the kinds of skills, I mean, I think it's been a struggle with quite a few organizations, like finding the right skills locally. And I think um, that was, you know, one of the reasons we created Zindi, the data science platform. Um, yeah, we found that, you know, through the work across the continent, we found that often like corporates um, didn't realize like what skills were available locally and then often like brought in international consultants and didn't really like acknowledge like local talent. Um, I think a problem with that is they don't always know where to find it and how to evaluate local talent. 
So it's like, it's kind of a, it's a case of like, how do you help an organization what they need? Um, and, you know, the type of tech person that's going to help them. Um, and then also teaching them to find those people and evaluate, evaluate them really well. So it's also, um, yeah, it's been quite a difficulty. I think in the space, a lot of people are great at writing CVs. So you often find like really good CVs, but that doesn't really translate into people that are good in the organization and pe people that have the right, um, the right tech uh, questions, um, or sorry, tech skills for, for that organization. So I think the evaluation becomes like the place where you really, really have to spend a lot of time making sure that you hire right. Um, and obviously hiring wrong can also be a time waster for an organization and it can be costly. So, so I think it's just something that, yeah, that's really important to get right. And if, I think I can add to your comment. You mentioned a, a lack of African skill into, or a lack of uh, human capital around data science in Africa and the need to hire external consultants from potentially outside of, of uh, the country where the, the company is operating or even outside of Africa. And I think one of the, the difficulties that companies face in adopting that approach is um, these consultants don't necessarily have a, a complete understanding of the, the context in which uh, the business is operating and the challenges that the customers face. So um, mm -hmm. there, there is a definite need um, within Africa to train African data scientists that uh, meet that, that understand the contextual nuances in which these products are designed to function. Yeah, definitely. And I think they often like they've often, um, you know, they don't always put themselves in the best like light because they often they've come from academic backgrounds and then they're in a corporate and they don't always understand the business world and they tend to like err on the side of being very theoretical, um, yeah. you know you know, focusing on like model accuracy and that really not always focusing on like, what does the business really need, you know, and, and just getting stuff out there often. It's just a case of like testing and learning and experimenting. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely like a difficult thing to, to get right. Um, and so that was also, I mean, that's one of the reasons we created Zindi is to have a way of like, you know, actually trying to evaluate, um, you know, whether somebody can use real world messy data to solve a problem um, that doesn't always address the need for you know the side of the business skills but um but yeah i think organizations are are realizing that they you know just the academic tech skills won't always get them what they want uh, fantastic and i i think that if you are trying to instill a culture within a business around data science having someone come in and speak very high level technically that not necessarily the right approach in order to get buy-in from the management staff who will then filter that focus throughout the business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my next question is for the Superfluid Lab. So um, within Africa, there is a, in, in terms of, uh, in the communities, there are individuals that have quite a limited digital footprint. Could you um, maybe expand on the use of alternative data in uh, attempting to credit score? Great. So uh, one thing we have found both with our work, but also with knowledge of other uh, successful businesses that have been able to use alternative data is that even with the individuals that are perceived to have limited digital footprint, they are very often very economically active and they are active in different ways. So I give the example of uh, mobile airtime and calling behavior. Many, many Africans, almost everyone now, um, has a mobile phone, calls, tops up airtime. And that is a proxy to individuals' financial behavior. Um, so one of the opportunities that we see, and we have seen businesses successfully uh, uh, unlock, is helping, uh, creating products or creating services that help digitize otherwise informal or otherwise offline activities. So for example, for a number of the uh, agricultural technology uh, startups and businesses we've worked with, they're actually helping smallholder farmers to digitize their crop production, to map the lands that they are uh, growing, produce on, what produce they are producing, um, how much their yield is historically and presently. And all of these data that is being captured for the first time in some cases is enabling these businesses and their partners to now profile and credit score these customers. 
So in, in other words, in many instances where there isn't um, widespread uh, accessibility to credit reference bureau across the continent, unfortunately, what it means is that many businesses would have to invest in collecting data or creating services that allow individuals to interact digitally. And by creating services that allow individuals to interact digitally, data will be created about those behaviors. And from that data, additional insights uh, can be gleaned that would guide new product development or for credit scoring or product recommendation. Thank you very much. Um, the last question for the session I have is for Yvette. And Yvette, you discussed and you spoke about a, a data champion within a business. And again, typically the, the companies that the data hack for FI works with are startups and emerging tech and emerging businesses that have a limited staff capacity. Would you mind expanding on what a data, cha a data champion's role is? Yvette, are you there? Yvette, I think you might be on mute. I'm happy to step in and answer that. Uh, Timothy, please, will you? Thank you. So, so, so a data champion is, uh, it could be different people, different roles. So let me give a very practical example. Earlier this week, uh, today's Wednesday, on Monday, I had a call with a startup based in Ghana. And this startup wants to invest into data, building a data science team because they see this as very essential for their long-term success. Today, they have a team of 10 developers, but the developers are busy with everyday tasks, building the product, maintaining it. Um, and in the middle of the conversation with uh, this CEO of the startup, it actually turns out that their chief financial officer, who is very good with Excel, is very, uh, passionate about using data to make data-driven skills. Unfortunately, he has limited programming skills using Python, but he's very passionate. So for this organization, the conclusion that we came to was that this chief financial officer is actually the best person um, to be appointed or to lead, spearhead the organization's transition into a data-driven enterprise because they work a lot with data. I think uh, Megan mentioned how you could start with financial data that you're collecting. And secondly, he understands or appreciates the value of the business, uh, the various drivers that affect the business's success. And so a data champion in this regard really can be anyone. It could be a chief operating officer, it could be a marketing lead, anyone who has that awareness about, uh, first of all, interest in making data-driven decisions but also has that appreciation for how the different aspects of the business function. And they are oftentimes the best bridge between the core developers or data scientists, as well as the business stakeholders. Great, thank you very much, Timothy. Um, and if there are no further questions that I can see, I think with that, we have reached the end of our webinar. So I would like to thank our speakers for taking the time to engage with us. And I hope that everyone who was uh, able to join us for the, the webinar enjoyed it. Next, I would like to extend good luck to the Data Hack for FI participants and the teams as you prepare to present your solutions at the various in-country finals, which are being held over the next two weeks. Very excited for all of the I2I staff who will be in attendance. So the top two teams from each of the seven countries will then be sponsored to attend the Data Hack for FI Grand Finale, which will be held uh, during Insight to Impact's Data Fest on the 22nd to the 23rd of August in Kigali, Rwanda. And the top 14 teams will then pitch to a panel of expert judges and potential investors with the hope of being crowned the Data Hack for FI Season 3 overall winner, who will receive 25,000 US dollars in seed capital. And you can visit our website, www.datahackforfi.org, for more details. Also, just a reminder, if you are tweeting or uh, on social media around DataHack, please, please use the, the hashtag datahack for fi uh, Lastly, before you leave, um, please will you complete the post-event survey that should appear on your screen any moment.